Welcome to the March 2021 CCAST, How Claims Automation is Transforming the Appraisal Experience. I'm Paul Berry, Executive Director of CICA. The Collision Industry Electronic Commerce Association, or CICA, develops and promotes electronic communication standards that allow the collision industry to be more efficient. Joining us today are Olivier Badu, Senior Vice President of Global Product Strategy and Artificial Intelligence for Mitchell International. Raj Pafal, founder and CEO of Claim Genius, and Jimmy Spears, head of automotive for Tractable. As we start the webinar, I want to remind you that there is no verbal communication between the participants and the presenter. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them in the questions panel on your screen. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. And now I'll turn it over to Olivia Badu. Good morning. Afternoon, evening, everyone, wherever you are. I heard we have a, a global audience today. Uh, excited to be presenting to all of you. I want to first thank Paul and Stacy from SICA to uh, give us a chance to address this audience on a really, really important topic, which is claims automation and how to transform the appraisal experience. My name is Olivier Badieu. I am responsible for the global product strategy and the artificial intelligence for Mitchell. I've been with the company for about five years and my background is in business transformation and process automation and oh boy, uh, in this industry over the last few years, we've seen uh, a lot of change here. So it's really exciting. I will be your host today. I'm delighted to have with me two guest speakers, Jimmy Spears from Tractable, as well as Raj Pofali from Claims Genius. How about Jimmy, you introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, hey, thank you for having me on. Uh, I'm Jimmy Spears, head of automotive for Tractable, and we're a company that develops artificial intelligence for accident and uh, disaster recovery. Uh, prior to joining Tractable, I was a, a, a lead in the USAA's auto experience, and then also I, I helped run the USAA Oval, um, the so Global Auto Physical Damage Program. Great. How about you, Raj? Want to say a few words? Absolutely. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. I'm Raj Pufre. I'm the founder and CEO of Claim Genius. Uh, Claim Genius is uh, AI insurtech focused on to the passenger vehicle claims process. And we are using our computer vision technology to basically uh, get the vision uh, of touchless claims uh, reality in place. Uh, prior to Claim Genius, uh, I was working for the financial technology industry uh, for over 20, 22 years. I was head of technology for NASDAQ, one of the business unit. And Claim Genius has started in uh, 2017, so roughly three over three years uh, young company we are. Thanks, sir. We're so lucky to have uh, Jimmy and Raj with us and getting their insights on artificial intelligence because if one thing is true, it is the rapid adoption and acceptance of artificial intelligence from where I remember just a few years ago being more of a research field, I remember struggling with finding early adopters to where we are now just a few years later with really uh, this must have now of artificial intelligence and, and almost this uh, fear of missing out being left behind if you're not uh, touching AI what a difference uh, a few years can make. And um, I think the, the reality though, it, it remains very unclear to a large audience, and I'm sure to many of you, what is the current state of artificial intelligence, whether, whether it's ready for adoption uh, and how quickly it can assist and potentially replace human beings. Um, so hopefully this session helps you to better understand how much AI can help accelerate the pace of claims automation. Another aspect which is so interesting to me is the number of references, just like you see here, to virtual, to automated, touchless estimate. I often find myself conversing with, um, with people and hearing virtual, AI, uh, touchless being one of the same, and there are not. Uh, fair enough, they are all rapidly evolving at the same time, but they cannot be lumped together as one of the same. 
Let me share my view and, and break it down for you. Uh, what I believe to be three concurrent trends, not sequential, concurrent trends that are, are all geared towards bringing more automation, all evolving in parallel, but yet very distinct. And don't think of them as sequential again, because in my opinion, they will all continue to coexist and feed off each other over the next few years. So number one is virtual estimating, which on itself is a paradigm shift from the field inspection, from the field estimate, allowing an estimate to be written of photos, often from a, a remote location versus being physically at the core with a, a field estimate. Virtual today remains, for the most part at least, uh, mostly human-driven though, with limited to no artificial intelligence. Number two is guided estimating. Uh, and at that point, fair enough, the machine is now coming in and can coexist with the human. Artificial intelligence is certainly becoming more feasible at that stage, but still not too intrusive and leaving room for the decision-making process to be done by the operator. And then three, automated estimating. And we're gonna be talking a lot about that. Not to be confused with touchless estimate. Touchless happens to be the holy grail, final destination of automated estimating. What we refer here by automated estimating is a process of pre-populating the estimate thanks to the machine, thanks to the photos, before the human can log on, accept that estimate to review or further edit the estimate. So let's start with uh, virtual estimating, which, as I mentioned, is mostly performed by the appraiser or the virtual appraiser but just by virtue of being online behind the computers allows for the a greater volume to be dramatically uh, created anywhere from we've seen five maybe six seven field estimates per day to 15 20 and we even see 25 virtual estimates that can be created per day and although uh, virtual estimating is definitely not new to, uh, to the auto claims, the, the pandemic has dramatically accelerated its adoption. I think it's fair to say that just like the pandemic has taught us a lot, that we can in particular as a person be more efficient uh, working from home than working from the office, we've learned that virtual estimate can be as efficient and effective. And what I mean by that is not only creating a higher volume per day, better experience, uh, but also do it in a way where it doesn't come at the expense of the severity of the estimate or the supplementation rate, which, again, has been a major concern in the past, and, and we've seen great results. And those efficiency gains uh, have come from leveraging out of the letters technologies uh, and the cloud in particular, we like to say that with the cloud, we can write an estimate from anywhere, anytime, from any device. And um, wow, that comes pretty handy, especially with the pandemic, with social distancing, being able to write an estimate from uh, anywhere. But it doesn't have necessarily anything to do with artificial intelligence. I, I find it fascinating uh, that today when people hear about automation, they automatically think about AI. It, it, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, look, my coffee maker every morning starts automatically, believe it or not, but with no AI. And, uh, and that's true. Um, automation is happening, virtual is improving uh, dramatically, and it's thanks to uh, great technology that we keep building and adding. The ability, for instance, to uh, auto-select the best estimate profile based on the location of the vehicles, based on the, the location of the accident, the option to uh, uh, create a more optimal workspace. Because remember, as a remote appraiser, you may be in a different state, a different country even, and being able to control and hide sensitive information to a virtual appraiser may be very, very important. And we can now do that with the technology. 
or, or the option to auto select the most optimal part. Because as a virtual appraiser, you may no longer have the same relationship with your nearby vendors, support providers, and the ability for the system to auto select the most optimal part is really, really important. And so we see great results, great automation and efficiency with virtual estimating. Uh, we see now estimates being written in less than 10 minutes, which was uh, impossible in the past. Shifting to uh, guided estimating. So um, fair enough, at that point, uh, now we gotta be uh, talking about the machine, about artificial intelligence. And you may have seen in particular uh, that article from Forbes magazine talking about computer vision and how it is coming really fast and disrupting many different industries. And I love how uh, they put it as computer vision is the automation of human side. And that's really true. The ability to create more consistency and to be able to grow looking through the lenses of the machine. But people talk about AI, talk about machine learning, talk about deep, deep learning. And it's interesting because uh, they tend to use interchangeably any of those terms without really understanding what that means. The other thing which uh, I find interesting is AI has been going on now for 50, 60, 70 years. And only in the last few years, we start seeing AI coming really fast and making a difference into our industry. So even the fact we have the experts, uh, I thought I would uh, ask them, uh, what is AI? How do we make a, dist a distinction between those different sciences? And why now? How about, Raj, you share your perspective on that. Absolutely. Uh, I'll try to put it in a very simplistic way. So uh, basically AI is nothing but a capability of a machine to basically imitate a human intelligence or a brain. Uh, just like us, right? I mean, we, we look at uh, several patterns out of a large data set. For example, you know, uh, if I'm looking at this cup, uh, I'm seeing, you know, uh, throughout my life, I'm seeing thousands and millions of these kind of in cups. Or in our use case, I'm looking at the vehicles, uh, you know, or the part of the vehicle or damages. My brain immediately tells me what that object is, right? And that's what machines need to do, but it needs to do be uh, to be doing in a very consistent and non-biased uh, way. At the same time, it has to be more accurate and it has to be fast, just like a snap at a finger. So there are there are different ways of doing it, as Olivia also mentioned that machine learning and deep learning, right? So uh, depending upon the use case, uh, you know, these two, uh, uh, you know, approaches can be used. Machine learning is more of, a, you know, uh, a structured data set or the smaller set of data that can be trained faster, right? Uh, whereas the deep learning uh, is mostly rely on the uh, artificial neural networks uh, or the CNN, that's convolution neural network, uh, what we use. It's a more challenging problem. It's a, it needs a larger data set. It needs a larger time of, uh, you know, larger time to train our machines. Now, uh, a very simple example to relate with of what AI is uh, on our day-to-day -day life, right? Uh, we get these movie recommendations out of Netflix. That's a very simple example of AI. Uh, now, AI is there for a long time, right? Uh, but to process this kind of an humongous data set, uh, the computing power that was required was not there before. Now with this powerful GPUs and TPUs are available, machine learning and AI uh, is becoming more easier, right? And that's where uh, AI is getting implemented across the multiple industry. But in particular, I think AI is a very best fit, uh, you know, technology for our industry, especially insurance collision uh, industry. Because if you look at certain operations that we do, uh, it takes number of days or hours, and we are losing a lot of money and time on that. And that's where AI comes very handy. But I would like to, you know, state one thing that we have to look at this AI with a very right set of ex expectation. It is not a magic wand. Uh, it's not going to give you a 100% accurate result because 
we humans are not 100% accurate, right? And we are training them, the machines. It's more of a collaborative journey. Uh, and at the last but not the least, AI is not a replacement uh, for the humans. It is a tool which is basically bringing more efficiency to our lives. So uh, with the current need of the industry and basically bringing more and more efficiency and automation and digitization, AI is coming very handy. And that's the reason uh, I say, you know, it is the time now to, to start using AI. Thank you, Raj. Appreciate it. How about you, Jimmy? Want to well, you know, share yeah. your opinion maybe yeah. on what's driving this rapid change towards AI? And, and maybe what you may want to uh, touch on as well, because uh, in the audience, I'm sure everyone is, is investing, thinking about AI and, and, and potentially looking at it in, in two ways. Uh, one would be to, to build within, hire their own data scientists, build their own in house models versus partner and engage third party companies like Tractable or Claims Genius. Can, can you may speak about that as well? Uh, certainly, I, I will. Um, and we think about what's really driving uh, this rapid change. There's really four things. Number one, it vastly improves the customer experience. Number two, AI is now fast. And number three, it really helps with this whole touchless environment that we have. And number four, it really helps uh, people with the increasing complexity of the technology of vehicles to be able to help them uh, really concentrate on customer service and then be able to have uh, AI help them understand more about how the vehicle's built and certainly how the appraisal is going to be conducted. Uh, but when we do take a look at customer experience, uh, I know that we say that there is a whole new breed of customers out there, and I know that people refer to the millennials. And they refer to them because uh, they grew up in a way uh, that they expect things almost instantly. I'll tell you what, millennials didn't make Amazon the, the, the biggest retailer in the world. It was everybody. Uh, this whole new breed of customers is what everyone expects now. Um, so I believe that AI can really bring that level of service all the way. And if we start to think about, if you're gonna build it in-house, there's a tremendous amount of uh, resources, tremendous amount of uh, training uh, that goes into AI. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge specialty. Um, uh, I would really certainly recommend third party. Um, and uh, I would recommend uh, an open platform uh, particularly with the with the third party, um, because with an open type of a platform, you're not restricted to a mediocre or an underperforming AI that's built into your present platform. You now have a choice, and you can actually compare which is the best workflow, which is the best model that I can use. And we'll talk about models a little bit later on, uh, but uh, really to understand uh, should you build it in house? That that that's a tough one. I would certainly recommend going third party, especially knowing what I, I know now. That's great. That's great. And we're going we're gonna to come back to that as well. So very, uh, very good. Um, so wanted to, uh, to give you an example. We're still under guided estimating, and I wanted to give you an example of uh, how the machine can collaborate with a human, uh, not taking over, not uh, necessarily replacing the person, but assisting the machine here. So. What you're seeing here is something we're very excited about, something that will be uh, coming to market soon, and is showing how the machine is um, surfacing recommendations to an appraiser. So there's a, a, a very sophisticated model that is uh, sitting behind and is surfacing a set of recommendations of what could be the next line to be added onto the estimate here. And the appraiser can simply select themselves manually all of those lines uh, to be added onto the estimate. So they don't have to navigate through the, the product catalog and find the right part. They automatically have to accept those recommendations here. And even better, the more entries, the more selection they make, uh, the more uh, the models will refine that list of uh, recommendations. So it can expedite the process even further. Very similar to when you think about um, um, uh, Netflix or you think about uh, your, your, your music and Spotify, um, constantly uh, watching 
uh, looking at your preferences and trying to predict what could be the next logical chart, movie, or line items that you want to add on to the estimate here. And that's that the uh, idea of guided estimate here. We're super excited about it. And, and, and it shows you how the human is still in control, but the machine is, is uh, absolutely uh, providing great um, uh, efficiency and automation here. Shifting gears now, we're going into automated estimating, which I know many of you are, are impatiently waiting for. Um, and so um, uh, at, at the core resides a, a very sophisticated AI model, being able to consume photos, potentially videos, telematics, other claims information, and can predict on many features such as the, the type of damage or the repair operation, whether it's a repair or replace. And it can do that on more and more panels or, or components of the car. And as you can imagine, uh, just like microprocessors for uh, PCs or, uh, or digital cameras for mobile phones, every release, every version will improve the model, improve the accuracy and the coverage that you can expect. And although conceptually those models are pretty standard, it's fascinating to realize that they are all different. Each AI company like Tractable and Claims Genius bring their own assets and their own techniques of training those models and, uh, and have a different perspective on optimizing those results. So um, since we have the experts here, how about we ask them uh, to uh, share the perspective on, on what makes their model unique, uh, what methodology they may be using, and what are their key differentiators. Jimmy, how about we, uh, we start with you this time? Sure. Um, one of the things to, to think about when we uh, look, take a look at Tractable's AI models, number one, it's, it's locally calibrated and locally configurable to how you do business. Um, it's configured uh, to each insurer's and body shop's different workflows, and it's robust. Uh, it's unbelievably ro robust. It's trained off of hundreds of millions of data points, and it is fast, unbelievably fast as far as writing the appraisal and also the ease of integration and the speed of integration, uh, getting it to, to work within your systems and your workflows and what I really love about it, 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 is, it is smart. Uh, the algorithms and the, the way that we've programmed uh, this is that not only does it, it has one series of, of learnings, it continuously learns, particularly with those partners that we have that, that share data with us that, that help us uh, uh, rebuild our algorithms constantly. And one of the things that I really think separates us is that it's so smart that it makes decisions off of things that it hasn't really been fully programmed for yet. And what I mean by that is, is that a new make and model of car can come out. Um, our AI will still know it's a hood, it'll know it's a door, it'll know it's a fender. Uh, so um, um, it, can, it can just start to, to, to learn, grow, understand, um, and, and really grow with your organization. That's great. How about uh, you, Raj? You wanna, you wanna share your perspective as well? Absolutely. I mean, this is a very complex problem to be solved. We need must appreciate that. But our approach, we are trying to keep it very simple. First of all, our approach is basically how do we replicate that adjuster's mind and brain uh, in order to do this uh, assessment, right? How do we mimic that? Uh, so we have kept it uh, at a very uh, global and uh, you know generalized approach because. In our opinion, a vehicle is vehicle you go anywhere in the world. A sedan is a sedan or a hatchback is a hatchback and an SUV is an SUV. So we basically look at, uh, you know, when we are, we are looking at all of that, uh, these vehicles, we are looking from the body type standpoint, uh, not to a particular make and model, but because that's not going to be scalable. So, uh, you know, wh when we look at all of these different damages, we literally go to the level of details about, you know, uh, uh, what are those different type of damages, damage classifications, right? So we we do all of that in a in a terms of a global way, right? Obviously, it is trained on millions of images across the globe, but the main important aspect of it is 
the localization of the uh, of the total loss adjustment rules, right? Uh, or you know, the uh, loss adjustment rules in different geographies, right? A vehicle which can be declared total loss in US could be repairable in other parts of the world, or a part that needs to be replaced here needs to be repaired in other parts of the world. So basically, we have this horizontal platform which actually does this global identification of the parts and damages and on the top of it basically it puts this customization to address those local loss adjustment rule uh, so that's the kind of an simplistic approach that we have taken i mean it sounds very simple but it's very complex to solve and uh, we know how much efforts it needs uh, in order to get to that level on the top of it we are looking at next level of assessment right so uh, how does a, a, a adjuster will do uh, uh, you know the internal damage assessment so we are developing the algorithm which actually gives you what is behind the hood i'll talk more about that later but the important aspect uh, of how do we continuously increase the accuracies of our algorithms right so what plays the important role of it is the data quality and the way that we acquire this data right so we are basically bringing many of those uh, techniques and tools in place so that we can get a best uh, data quality. Uh, we are moving ahead as in key differentiator, as you asked, Olivier, we are moving ahead one step from the images world into the videos world. So we are now looking at the 360 degree video, and then we are basically doing the assessment on, on those video, and that's happening real time, right? Literally within a fraction of minutes, you would get all these assessment ready. And the collaborative journey that I had mentioned earlier in my comment, uh, we look for that collaboration through the active feedback that our customers gives us. And then we have all the features, uh, uh, you know, bells and whistles that a customer can give their inputs so that our active feedback can learn, our algorithms can learn out of it and then produce the best, uh, you know, results to fit to that particular market. So that's, uh, that's how we are basically looking at this problem and trying to uh, you know give you that kind of a best solution that's great thanks rash uh, and yeah it, it's so interesting you, you hear common themes um being able to train thanks to uh, millions of photos and and at the same time you, you hear how uh, every company is trying to specialize fine-tune further look at where it's going and, and all of that is is so rapidly uh, evolving very very insightful uh, thanks for sharing guys um so I uh, wanted to give you an example here. Um, again, any, any of those models, any of those solutions providers here uh, will be able to uh, predict on something like you see in here, with three images being exposed to the machine, it will be able to predict on, in this example here, up to 29 different components of the vehicles. Some of them even being interior or hidden panels, uh, like the condenser or the radiator. Um, the machine can, can now predict based on historical information and what it's, it has seen um, on many, many different components here. And, uh, and it will also return a predictions on what operation should be applied to that part, whether it should be repair or replace, potentially other operation as well. And we'll, we'll come back to that as well. So just wanted to give you an example here of how now computer vision really can, can provide great predictions here. So now the whole point of getting greater AI models is to put it to use. And in particular, to help write an automated estimate. And although automating an estimate can be complex, and it is, um, I like to describe it in a four simple steps. Number one is where photos, videos, claims information, VIN number uh, comes in. You try to gather as many artifacts as possible. So in step number two, you can bounce that information over to the machine so it can come back with uh, a set of predictions. Step number three is where the translation happens. That's where that generic information from AI, I can see a dent on the door, is being translated into VIN specific, vehicle specific information down to the port level, port number, port price, labor time for that operation, repair, replace. Um, and 
Step three is also going to uh, add any other repair operation that may be needed as well because of the damage that has been recognized. And I'm referring to um, R&I, for instance, or being able to add refinishing, blending. Uh, so one set of predictions or one um, information from AI may turn into many lines being automatically added to the estimate. And that's really that translation layer here. And then step number four is where it gets uh, injected. All of those line items of the estimate are being um, injected into the uh, estimating platform. And then at that point, uh, you have an estimate in your estimating platform and you can edit it, you can review it, and you can uh, export it into an EMS, BMS, SICA standard for downstream usage if you like. So now, uh, something we've done, which we're very excited about, uh, is to standardize step number two, uh, to allow for any AI partners, in particular Claims Genius and Tractable, to power automated estimating. Very similar to the SICA philosophy, we built an open platform strategy and a set of standards that allows any AI engine and potentially your own AI engine to be plugged in, giving a chance to all of, all of these great companies, all of the AI um, partners to innovate and to drive further automation. So now for you, Open allows you to define your own AI strategy, um, which means you can select your best AI partner, you can leverage your own AI assets, maybe your internal in-house models, and more importantly, you get the reassurance that you will be able to sustain your strategy as time goes by and never find yourself hostage of a single vendor or a sub-optimal solution. Because AI is changing so rapidly, why would you want to bet on a single host when you can have the flexibility to change course and continue to be on the right side of the winning team? And that's what Open gives you, a, a way to integrate once and ensure you can scale and align with your business strategy. And last, um, but not least, is to protect your secret source. And, and Raj, Jimmy, we're, we're starting to, uh, to talk about that. It, it is so important because you don't want to license a solution from a single company, which could level the playing field, leverage your own data, and undermine your key differentiators. So as we uh, look at those different AI uh, solutions available on the market, one of the most common questions that I'm getting is related to the maturity of AI, and, and in particular, um, the extent that it can automate um, the different solutions and the different estimates here. So uh, since we have the experts in residence here, um, how about we ask them uh, to share their perspective. What is the current state of uh, AI today? What are the limitations and where is it going in the future, according to you? How about we, uh, we start with you, Raj? Raj, you may be on mute. I'm, I'm sorry for that. No, uh, so uh, what I was saying, uh, as I earlier said that it's a collaborative journey, there is right now where the current technology stands, uh, we still need that collaboration between the human and, and the, um, uh, you know, uh, and the machines, right? So the way that we are addressing with our current technology is how we can basically take these videos and pictures and do the damage assessments, right? So, um, and again, as I said, we are mimicking the, the uh, you know, uh, assessment guys who do the assessment on this vehicle, the way that they do the assessment. So basically, the way that our current technology addresses is, you upload these pictures or the video, it automatically figures out where it belongs to. Is it a front of the vehicle, back of the vehicle, figures it out automatically. Then it identifies all the external panels, right? That includes big panels to the small parts, like a door handles and fuel leads. 
Then it goes into the next level to identify the scratches, the dent, the size of the dent, the position of the dents, or the tears, right? In a, in a nutshell, it does a severity analysis on a, a, all of these uh, you know, damages and then come up with the recommendations about the replace or the repairs, right? So in a, in a way, the way that a human is going to do the assessment, that's how these current uh, algorithms are, are doing it. Then it goes further down. So I, I was talking just from the external large kind of damages, but then now it goes to the level of precisions about a small scratches, the paint peel offs, uh, the windshield damages or the mirror damages, the wheel and the bumper misalignment, or even the airbag deployment, right? So it looks at that, it comes up with all of these um, damage assessment, then it goes further down and then looks at the zoomed in uh, pictures. This is a kind of a complex problem to solve. So, you know, we're still working on it, but as long as a human can identify that particular part and damages out of these zoomed in pictures, our algorithm should be able to do it. Then it goes further down in terms of providing the best digital experience to the end consumer, because ultimately that's what's going to happen. The consumers are going to basically click the pictures or the videos and get these estimates uh, you know, uh, within a matter of few uh, minutes or hours. So scanning the WIN numbers, right? And then decoding those uh, uh, WIN numbers using the WIN decoders and get the entire uh, details about this vehicle so that that can help uh, basically to determine whether that vehicle is, you know, what year, make, model, mileage, and based on all of this severity analysis, it can give you the, the total loss, right? So what are the different use cases the current technology can address will speak uh, as it comes. Uh, but that's in a nutshell the current technology provides. Now what's the future, right? So obviously it has to be real time on the edge devices. It needs to be a truly guided app the moment you uh, you know shot your camera at that vehicle it should tell you where to stand how to take the pictures or adjust the light uh, conditions so that the data acquisition that i was talking about gets even better so that helps to get a better accurate results uh, using the telematics data so that you can basically get more diagnostic uh, assessment from the internal damages right uh, that is on the roadmap we can create the crash uh, reconstruction uh, that is something that we are we are thinking of. Fraud is a bigger element that needs to be addressed because right now we are still scratching at the surface of the uh, you know uh, the problem. Uh, fraud is a bigger element. Uh, we can still use AI and then eliminate all of these frauds. So these are the kind of in future uh, futuristic uh, technologies and the use cases that we are looking at. And the uh, overall, basically, you know, how do we increase our accuracies to the level? that we can bring the state through processing still way to go there are there are, it's not going to happen you know in six months or in year stp is a long journey it is going to happen eventually but that's the goal that's how the technology is evolving that's how all the companies like us are working on it and then spending more and more efforts and that's when it comes handy as olive was earlier saying why to build in-house when we have companies like us that's awesome. There's a lot there uh, in, in what you just said here. And, uh, and I love how you are um, describing that consumer experience, looking for instant gratification, because it, it is absolutely something uh, uh, to be uh, looking forward to. Uh, Jimmy, how about you? How about you, uh, you share your perspective from uh, your standpoint? Certainly. Um, uh, I'll tell you, in the current state of technology, uh, fraud is something that we already do and, and in fact, excel at. And I know that uh, straight through processing may be somewhat of a journey, but it, it ain't that long a journey for us. Um, we're already doing it um, in Spain. Uh, so we, we're doing that type right now. And in the future, you'll see many more people do that as well. Um, one of the things that we're doing currently is that claims are starting to fall into three different buckets. Um, just about 40% are all being done by the machine, looking at it, writing the full appraisal end to end. The other 40% have about either one or two lines that humans need to come in and interact and complete the appraisal. Then the last 20% is you can write a pretty good outline of damages, uh, but what you do need to do is um, uh, take it somewhere else. It needs to have a full 
inspection. It needs to have just the, the classic blueprinting um, of uh, disassembly and write the appraisal. Now for future opportunities, like I said, uh, straight through processing, we're already doing that. Uh, but you're going to see more and more companies start to wrap their arms around it. And I'll tell you, I 100% agree with Raj. You're, you're going to see uh, uh, things open up. The connected vehicle is going to open up. We're going to get some of that data. Um, uh, people are going to have to get a return uh, on their investment with the uh, OE certification programs. I can see highly personalized experiences of, uh, of having uh, the AI data, uh, machine learning, taking a look at the vehicle, accompanied by the data that we're getting from these electric vehicles, all of these sensors, and really making a robust assessment of what's happening within the vehicle, uh, really helping uh, with those decisions. Because right now, we're 90% accurate when it comes to triage, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. I can just imagine how much more accurate we'll be once we truly have all the sensor and the data. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. So uh, before we close on automated estimating, I, I thought I would give you a quick demo of how automated estimating works, because interestingly enough, it, it's really, really hard uh, to uh, show the magic here because everything happens automatically behind the scenes. By the time you log on as an adjuster and appraiser, uh, that estimate is there, already available. So uh, everything is, is happening behind the scenes. So um, let's, let's pull back the curtain here uh, and give you a short preview of what's actually happening here. So I'm going to play a, a, a short video here. and I'm going to voice over. Uh, it's going to go pretty quick. Uh, given the time we have here, but I think it illustrates really well uh, what's happening behind the scene here before you even log on here. Um, so what, what you're looking at here is, uh, our, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's our Mutual Connect solutions. That's our main portal. That's where you see all of the claim information. That's where you see the policyholder, the vehicle information, the insurance company. Uh, and in a normal situation, as I said, the, the automated estimate would already be on here. It would be already written from the machine before the appraiser can even log on. But for the purpose of illustrating the full step process, we're going to break it down for you um, right before your eyes here. So let me uh, let me play it. And so what uh, what's happening here again is photos would uh, already be received to an API, but uh, because we're uh, doing it here before your eyes, I'm going to just grab a few photos from the local drive. Um, use those photos in order to ultimately create the estimate here. So we're uploading all of those photos. They're now attached to the claim, and that information is available. So at that point, we can now push all of that information, the VIN number, the photos, over to the AI engine. Um, you just uh, have to uh, simply select which one of those uh, open partners you want to grant the, the rights to receive all of those photos. You can select, uh, we're selecting the, the, the mutual AI solutions, Mira, Tractable, and the claims genius here. So they're all going to be receiving those photos here. And now they can be uh, sent over and be processed by the AI engine here. And it's really, really quick. As you were hearing before from Jimmy and Raj, just in a few seconds, you're going to have all of those photos in real time coming back. Uh, Mitchell, obviously, a little bit quicker because it's local to our servers, but even for uh, Tractable and uh, Clems Genius, in just uh, a few seconds, you have now the entire set of AI prediction that came back. You can simply click on it, and you can see all of those lines here were auto-generated from the machine. Uh, you can drill down to a particular part, like the real bumper, you can um, look at a particular uh, AI solutions like we have on here. So you have all of those photos which to the right, all of the predictions and the confidence level that came back and the operation repair versus replace. You can drill down to a, a particular photo and now you're looking specifically at what the machine was able to determine from that specific photo here. So you now have uh, everything you need um, step number two, to be able to translate that into an estimate here. 
And that's what you can do now. You just generate the estimate. Uh, you can select which one of those AI uh, solution you want to use. And then automatically now, the estimate is being auto-written by the machine. So you now have an estimate that just got created here. You simply click on it, and you're going to have all of those lines already on the estimate without any human intervention here. So now um, you can, as an adjuster, as an, as an appraiser, you, you can go and override any information. You can add lines. You can even remove lines if there's any false positive, false negative. Um, you're in full control here. You can add any information until uh, you deem that uh, estimate to be complete. And now you have an estimate here that is um, entirely completed, uh, partially done by the machine, uh, reviewed or, or, or completed by the person here. And that's what you get with automated estimating. Hopefully it helps to understand the, the process of automating an estimate here. So just wanted to uh, finish on a, a couple of other uh, use cases, other AI capabilities, because again, it, it's quickly changing, quickly uh, being uh, upgraded, and all of those great companies uh, are all working towards trying to help to further bring automation and, uh, and assist with other situations. So you see a few of them here beyond automating the estimate, you see triage, the ability for AI to predict really early on, thanks to the photos and other information, whether that car can be repaired or whether it's, it's deemed to be a total loss. And the sooner you know that, as you know, the, the, the better it is. Another uh, important uh, aspect and decision point in the claim process is reviewing the estimate, Wh whether it was uh, entirely written by a person or by a shop, or whether it was partially written by the machine and then edited by a person. You can now do a, a complete 100% review of all of your estimate thanks to the machine and to ensure uh, compliance and integrity with all of your standards and expectation here. And then last um, is um, pre-policy verification. And we see more and more of that as well. Uh, we see companies wanting to underwrite the vehicles and leverage computer vision, AI, in order to be able to better underwrite their vehicles here. And that's another opportunity. So um, wanting to, again, ask to our experts here, what are they working on? What are those use cases and AI capabilities that can further automate the claim um, so let, let's hear from them. Uh, how about you start, Jimmy? You want to share with us where Tractable is spending their time? Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, we have two use cases that we're going to cover pretty quickly. The first one is triage. And with triage, uh, we're doing this uh, all over the globe right now. Um, and in fact, for, for, for one carrier, um, we've actually reduced their cycle time by seven days. So it's a significant advantage uh, to them for the customer experience and also uh, for the way that they're handling expenses and, uh, and getting the car that's repairable right to the shop uh, as soon as they can. Uh, but the way that we handle it uh, is by, we send a link uh, either by uh, a text or we send a link by email at first notice of loss. Uh, the consumer is able to open it up, take images of their car, uh, and then with just uh, minutes, uh, we're able to uh, come back to them at a 90% accuracy rate to tell them if the car is repairable or not repairable. And like I said, with total losses, we're at 90%. And that number is getting better just all the time. Now, the second one um, is um, estimate review. And uh, this would just be a, a fantastic way, and, and shops do this, um, is that um, they're part of um, uh, programs that are with carriers, preferred shop programs. Uh, there's really no need uh, to have all your staff look at uh, uh, different appraisals that will pass. Uh, our AI is like another set of eyes, uh, calibrated to the way that, that you want to write appraisals or the way that your end customer uh, wants to have appraisals written. Uh, the AI uh, passes through, uh, when it needs to be um, uh, uh, taken to the next level, 
um, uh, they, they, we can certainly do that. Uh, the two ins the insurance carrier and the shop can talk on those escalation events, or those 80% can just pass through so quickly. And we have what I would call uh, this trust-based system of being able to pass work over quickly, get the customer taken care of, uh, really accelerate the experience. Um, and those are the two type of use cases uh, that we have of, of many that we offer. That's great, thanks, Jimmy. Uh, how about you, Raj? Uh, Want to share a little bit more as well what, what you are um, working on beyond just automated estimating? I think it, it'd be interesting for the audience as well to understand where it's going and, and where you bring in a lot of um, expertise. Absolutely. <clears throat> So there are a couple of use cases that uh, you know we are addressing. As I earlier said, that it's a horizontal stack which actually does the vehicle damage assessment. So even beyond the insurance carriers, we uh, we address uh, certain use cases. Uh, triage is obviously the first one, where a customer basically can take the pictures out of carrier's app or our app, or our app can get basically get integrated, or API can get integrated through SDK. With the uh, with the carriers, uh, you know, uh, data acquisition uh, tools. Once we get those pictures or the video, we instantly basically come up with first level of triage, saying that is it a total loss vehicle or is it the uh, is it a repairable? If it is in total loss, expedite it to the auction yard and then you know uh, reduce the time uh, in order to basically do the further settlement. The second one is obviously as we go to the more rational levels of detecting the damages and classifying those damages, we go to the more level detail level of the conditioning reports for those vehicles. Uh, you know, which obviously further expand into the uh, into the uh, full estimate uh, using the MIOP uh, route, as Olivier had uh, shown in the demo earlier. Then it further, uh, you know, so basically these are the something, some of the use cases within the insurance claim space that we are looking at. And obviously we look at the different categories of the claim. Most of the, uh, you know, as we all know, majority of the volume is always in that minor, you know, damages or the uh, low severity damages kind of in claims. So we can fairly do a quick, uh, you know, uh, ballpark partial estimate even in that region so that basically uh, customers can or the carriers can basically expedite the claim settlement another important aspect or the use case that we uh, you know uh, we uh, address is that pre-inspection uh, and then automate the underwriting process by doing the damage uh, estimation and further down it, I mean some of the customers that we are working in the US is basically doing the uh, you know uh, going to do basically the classification or the comparison rather that's the right word comparative analysis between the pre-accidental damages and the post-accidental damages as we are we are doing the entire life cycle from the underwriting to the claims so those are the certain uh, uh, you know use cases that we are addressing and beside the insurance claim space as we uh, you know are doing this classification kind of an uh, damage classification kind of an uh, assessment uh, we are also addressing use cases for the rental cars, leasing, and uh, even the recyclers, uh, because we are basically following the ARA standards in order to provide those conditioning reports. So those are the uh, you know couple of uh, uh, use cases that we are we are doing, and obviously uh, the tools that we are providing right through our mobile app or through the dashboards that you are seeing on the screen, it interacts with the reviewers uh, you know who can basically get the inputs so that's uh, that's how we are we are addressing the space olivier that's great thank you raj very uh, very appreciate it it's fascinating to me to hear again these two top ai companies and i obviously i spent a fair amount of my time with with many ai companies and they all share uh, many of those common themes why still trying to to attack it in in a different way and specialize further and and that's the beauty really of all of those uh, great talented company here so uh, um, very uh, very exciting to see a lot of progress here i'm, I'm hoping uh, that uh, really you found that uh, presentation really interesting insightful i think it's pretty clear that we're just scratching the surface here of what ai can bring 
Um, and I can't wait to see where, where it's going next. Um, and so that concludes this presentation. I'm, I'm hoping, again, that, uh, that, was, uh, that was very interesting. I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Paul if we uh, have any question. Uh, if we do not have the time, uh, obviously do not hesitate to reach out to me directly. Happy to help, uh, happy to uh, share uh, our view and our uh, perspective on AI and where it's going from an automation standpoint. Uh, thank you again, and uh, Paul, take it away. Thank you, Olivier, Raj, and James. That was a really good, good presentation. Um, Stacy Phillips, who's our marketing director for SICA, has been monitoring the webinar for questions. Stacy, do we have any questions for the group? Yes, our first question is, we are developing our own AI models. Can we plug our own AI in-house solution into the open platform and generate our own automated estimating? Yeah, so 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 very good question. And I quickly went over, but, but it's it's really, really important. We know and we understand that uh, top insurers and top companies are absolutely wanting to leverage their big data, uh, wanting to develop their own in-house AI solutions. And so the answer is absolutely. Uh, it, it's actually a, a big part of this uh, open platform strategy is you bring uh, your own asset, um, you bring your bottle to the party here, and then we uh, can use it in, in different ways. We can either use it uh, the way it is, if that is your preference, because you feel like you have uh, the holy grail AI solutions that will optimize your decision and your estimate, or uh, we can supplement, we can bring you and fill gaps that you feel like, look, I'm, I'm really good at, at, um, at, at uh, finding out those damage, but I may not be true uh, or accurate when it comes to uh, predicting on repair versus replace, and, and we can do that. We can do break-even analysis and make sure that we're checking on uh, the, the most optimal part and the availability of those parts as we're making um, uh, that uh, recommendation here. And, and that's something we do already with some of our uh, customers and partners. Um, they have some of AI and they want to uh, get some assistance and we're, we're here to help. So absolutely really critical uh, to be able to allow for your own in-house AI to uh, play a, a role and to even bias the solution towards obviously what you bring uh, to the table. Thank you. We have time for one more question, and additional questions will be answered by the presenters and posted on the Sika.com website, along with the recording. But our next question is, as intelligence is rapidly moving from human experts to machines, how do we ensure that it doesn't put everyone at the same level and reduce our key differentiators? Yeah, so, so that, that's a, a very uh, critical question, which which is a common concern that I hear um, from many, uh, many leaders. Because uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, you do not want to have your um, really key differentiators, your secret sauce uh, being uh, really exposed here. Uh, and, uh, and the open platform allows you to decide your own AI strategy. Uh, not only you can pick and choose your uh, preferred AI vendors or solution provider, uh, but you can you can fine tune your decision. Um, you can ensure that ultimately your uh, book of business, your standards, your preferences can be taken into account. And we heard earlier uh, from Jimmy from Rash around localization, around this process of calibration here. So um, maybe I, I will ask uh, again Raj and Jimmy to maybe comment a little bit more here. Uh, what does calibration entails here? How do you ensure that the solution that you're building is something that is specific and can respect, again, the uh, key differentiators of all of our customers and partners? Jimmy, you want to maybe share your view on that? Oh, certainly. Um, and, you know, when I, when I was talking earlier, I said one of the key things uh, that, that really makes us a unique option is that, that we do calibrate locally. Uh, there will be an exercise of, of where 
uh, you have your appraisers, the, the people that are, in, and also people developing your workflow. Um, it'll take a look at um, some decisions that the AI makes. And then we calibrate with that over a period of a couple weeks. Um, and um, at some point, you'll start to see uh, the human to human calibration is at a lower number, but the human to machine calibration, meaning that the, cal that the, 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 the machine is really calibrated towards the whole uh, group, just goes off the charts. So that's how we, we do it. It's a, it's a very interactive session. Uh, it's very um, intense and in understanding workflows, protecting secret sauces, and really understanding at things at a very local, regional level, um, and certain ways that, that companies approach certain problems. Yeah, well stated. And we, and we have a very similar calibration process. Raj, uh, I know you do as well. Want to maybe uh, share your perspective on, on, on that process of calibration? Uh, absolutely. Uh, again, I'm I'm going to harp on to my earlier comment about the collaborative journey, right? So, it that that is what uh, important factor is. AI is not like any other software development that you develop it once and it is done. AI is a continuous journey. It needs to continuously learn the new data, and that is only going to happen through the calibration and fine tuning, and that needs to happen through the active feedback that I was uh, earlier talking on. So when we are basically working with any of the carrier or for that matter, any of the customers, they have their own business needs. AI needs to function and uh, basically mold according to their business needs. So the, the tools and the features that we have developed that allows them to basically feed into the system and then you know uh, the active feedback uh, mechanism that we have, it continuously train our algorithm. So, use case by use case it start automating more and more and less human interaction but it is going to be the continuous journey uh, i just wanted to make sure that you know there is no myth i mean there are a lot of myths about uh, about ai and i want to make sure that you know we look at this in the very right uh, with the right expectations and collaborate uh, together so that's how that's how this calibration uh, you know uh, needs to come into the place that's how the localization uh, what jimmy was also mentioning needs to come into this place and then we are basically providing all the tools and techniques and technologies and continuously optimizing our our uh, platform in order to basically you know uh, learn the new uh, nuances of this field and then address that and make it more automated yeah, and thank you. Thank you, Raj. Thank you, Jimmy. I know we're at time. I want to respect that as well. So again, any questions, please feel free to follow up with me. Happy to help. And uh, you have a good rest of your day. Great. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you um, for the opportunity. Please join us next month for part of our SICA technical series, where we'll present SICA R1 2021 standards. We'll discuss the latest changes to SICA standards and answer any technical questions related to the implementation and use of SICA standards. SICA has partnered with the Automotive Management Institute. Attendees of this webinar are eligible to receive credit towards a professional designation from AMI. After taking a short quiz on the site, a link will be sent to all attendees. Please follow SICA's social media platforms to stay up to date on upcoming events and SICA news. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you.